for people that don't know, um, from, from roles at Heineken, where you were deep on data and analytics, and, and maybe maybe got into some product at, at Heineken too, um, or Hilton when, um, obviously when COVID hit, you were still at Hilton, which was a big challenge, or uh, even in customer retention at CVS Health, uh, and, and now at Gannett as VP, head of customer engagement and retention, um, clearly sitting at the intersection of what a lot of people are thinking about right now, data and what's happening on the platform uh, and engaging consumers, uh, taking them obviously from an offline universe to an, to an online universe with, around engagement. Um, I just thought it'd be great if you could tell us a little bit about your current role at Gannett and what you've been tasked with doing there. Absolutely, and thank you again for having me here. So, and thanks Jake for the introduction. So, uh, very excited to be here. Uh, I only joined Gannett uh, US Saturday Network uh, about around three months back. My current role is actually pretty exciting. So what I'm focused on is I'm trying to kind of make sure that all customers that we are acquiring as a part of our broader charter of growing digital subscription, we are engaging these customers and we are making sure that like, you know, uh, they like us enough to kind of stay with us. So trying to kind of, you know, build loyalty through engagement, through value proposition and delivery to our customers and through an experience that kind of matches none. So, uh, so very ambitious charter, uh, but that's what I'm focused on recently. Great, yeah, um, I think that's super exciting. Um, you know, privacy is a topic that comes up a lot, uh, both in, in the trade press, as well as, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in common company and conversation, everyone's talking about privacy, what it means in the digital space, what it means on the device. Um, yet you're tasked with personalization and customization. And these things are always in constant tension. On one end of the universe, we have privacy. And on the other end, we have that personalization and customization. So I'm assuming in your role, you have to address that. How do you, how do you think about privacy concerns while, while delivering on those goals that you just talked about? That, that's a great question, Jake, and thank you for that. Um, and I think that's a question that a lot of enterprises are asking themselves today like you know uh, what is it that we can actually like you know offer to our customers in return to the data that they agree to sharing with us and i think uh, like you know uh, when we talk about personalization we often kind of you know uh, uh, assume that it includes customization uh, whereas like you know in in marketing world especially uh, personalization in my language is hyper targeting making sure that we are reaching out to the right customer with the right content and the right message and converting that customer either to kind of, you know, uh, become a customer, so we convert a prospect, or to kind of, you know, have a customer stay with us. I think in my role, like, you know, uh, we are trying to kind of become customer advocates and customer champions. Now, what that means is uh, there's a trade-off that the customer has uh, when he or she basically, like, you know, uh, allow or opt in to, back, to being monitored. Uh, they do that for, for a very specific reason. The reason is, they're, they are opting in to basically improve their own experience. Uh, there's, there's like the one thing that kind of is in a big shortage, uh, and like, you know, I'm sure like, you know, there will be a big shortage going forward as well as time. Our customers don't have time to kind of, you know, uh, optimize, customize their experience every single time they log in. So if they are allowing for us to kind of, you know, monitor and like, you know, track their, their like, you know, online journey, we owe them like, you know, that, that ease of usage, we owe them that comfort, we owe them that saving of time. So I think uh, when it comes to privacy, I think our customers are not all the same. Uh, and what we really need to focus as organizations is, what is it that the customer wants from us? So instead of like, you know, kind of preempting that this is what my customer would need and like, you know, having a big giant customer persona, I think we need to break it down. We need to understand what does our customer mix look like? what kind of customer expects what from us. And there are customers who are very concerned with privacy and which is totally fair, right? So uh, uh, like, you know, and, and for them, like, you know, uh, again, it's an exchange, it's a trade-off. So if, if you are not being like, you know, monitored, if you're not opting in for cookie tracking, you basically are missing out on that experience, but that's okay. Like, you know, for, for that particular customer, we need to respect the fact that for them, privacy comes over and above the ease of usage. For a customer like me, like, you know, I don't really mind being monitored by like, you know, 10 organizations because what I care for is how can I save my time? Like, you know, when I'm logging in, like, you know, can I get what I'm interested in as the first, second or third items when I log in? And I think that's what we are focused on as an organization. Listen to a customer, listen to what they want and like, you know, try and deliver to them 
And if, if you talk about personalization, it's more like you know, personalization of experience. So putting our customer in the driving seat, I think that's the way to go in terms of engaging and retaining your customer. I always like getting specific. So a lot of times panels can get too general and I think well, let's get into the meat here. Give me an example. I'm super curious. Like, is there something that you implemented across Gannett since you've, I, I know you're relatively new, but is there something that you could point to? I'm sure you collect a lot of data points on what's working and what's not. Is there something that you guys implemented that led to a huge amount of additional email signups or just something that you see usage wise across the experience of Gannett as a platform that you see has grown either engagement or something that's had a lot of positive impact? Absolutely. So, uh, and uh, there are the next one. <laughs> yes, I'm very new to the role, so I don't really have a lot of examples. But there are a few that actually come to mind. Like, you know what we've done recently. So one of the examples is if I talk about just one channel, like you know email, and if I talk about like you know what is it that we are sending out to our customers, uh, when we make our emails too generic, and I'm pretty sure this is like preaching to the choir, like you know assuming we are all marketers here. When the email is too generic and like you know has content that's focused on like the broad plethora of our customers, uh, we don't really get the same amount of open rates as to what we get when we address it to that person, and we actually like you know bring a lot of local nuances to it. So I'm um, like you know when people hear USA Today Network and Gannett, they kind of assume we are like USA Today only. We are 260 brands, so we are like you know one of the most local organizations when it comes to media and news. And, and what that means is like, you know, uh, people that we have like, you know, in those markets, they want to hear from journalists, editors in those markets. They want to hear on topics that they are interested in. And one of the recent example is like, you know, uh, when we send out those emails for our customers who are now preparing for their kids to go back to school uh, amidst all this, like, you know, coronavirus Delta variant, uh, like, you know, concerns. Um, and when we kind of, you know, uh, made those emails go out based on like, you know, or coming from like the local newsrooms. The, not just the open rates were above the roof, but we actually heard from our customers. And like, you know, people kind of assume that customers complain and like, you know, they only send a, reach out to us when they have an issue. We heard from customers that, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I was looking for. And like, you know, uh, uh, and like, you know, the appreciation that they have for that local nuance, I think that is like step number one. Uh, in our journey towards customizing their experience and like, you know, talking to them in their language, which I think is, is a big thing that kind of gets missed out when you have a large national organization. So, so that's just one example, right? Like, you know, our, our, our engagement rates were above the roof. Like, you know, we saw a lot of people not just read the news, but also come to our platform and engage further. And I think, uh, and I think it's only a function of like, you know, giving to our customers what they want. Great, I love that example. It's an example that, of course, is reliant on email. So um, at some point, you had to take an audience that was uh, logged out and um, get them to give up some personal information. So assuming that the Gannett universe is a generally logged out universe, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe it, it, in great success, maybe you're at 10% logged in. Um, how do you think about building that strategy to get that customer loyalty? What are the kinds of things that you're putting in place? You've talked somewhat about personalization, but maybe get a little deeper in terms of what are the, is, 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 there a, is there a funnel approach? Is there a channel approach? How do, you, how do you take this massive logged out audience and start to bring them to a place where you could convert just to even get an email address? That, that's a fantastic question. And that's a challenge that you know, not unique to us. Uh, I've worked for like so many previous companies in CPG, healthcare, hospitality, and trust me, that challenge has been there all across. But I would say there's like, you know, uh, what we are trying to do right now is we are trying to kind of make sure, uh, again, like, you know, thinking of our customer first and like, you know, approach. Uh, we start with three lenses. So the first lens that we have is customer 360. Understanding, like truly understanding who our customer is and also understanding like, you know, what all exposure do they have from our side? Like, you know, how, how much are we speaking to them across all channels? And then also trying to kind of, you know, hypothesize like, you know, what else is this customer exposed to? Because we don't really have a customer for USA Today Network, uh, which is different from a customer for like, you know, a YouTube, which is different from a customer for a Prime. It is the same customer. They're the same customer is exposed to all different kinds of experiences. So we are trying to make sure that, like, you know, we truly understand who our customer is and like, you know, what is it that they come to us for? 
The second lens that we have is Benefit 360. To understand like, you know, what is it that the customer gets from us? Any relationship where we are focused on retention uh, has to have like, you know, value proposition that both parties are getting. And our ambition and like, you know, what we are pursuing right now is to grow that value and to grow that value with the tenure of our customers. So like, you know, it's not like you know, they kind of come to us for one thing and they kind of stay. And the third one is uh, voice of customer. So listen to our customers and listening does not just mean surveys, like, you know, understand, like, you know, what is it that they share on social? Like, you know, what is it that they kind of give to us feedback? What is it that they tell us when they call us at our call centers? And why these three lenses are important to your, getting back to your question, Jake, is uh, if you think of like, you know, the customer journey that we have, like, you know, our retention and engagement efforts don't actually start after you become a customer. They actually start before you become a customer, right from like, you know, who are we targeting? What is the promise that we are making them? Because if we don't deliver the promise, they'll leave right away. Uh, how easy is it for them to kind of sign up, like, you know, to kind of, you know, come and like, you know, uh, like, you know, become a member. Then are we onboarding them carefully? Like, you know, are we educating them about all the benefits that they get after being a subscriber? There's a subscription. And I think there's a USA Today article recently. There's a subscription exhaustion. Like, you know, people have so many subscriptions today. So we, we can't just be like, you know, one on top of all the others that they have. We kind of have to illustrate the value that we bring forward. And then, like, you know, we, we are continuously trying to kind of engage and like, you know, reward our customers. So, uh, and then like, you know, eventually we want to make sure that we retain them, like, you know, mitigate any churn and like, you know, win them back. But throughout the journey, the focus that we have is one, like best in class customer experience. And second, like, you know, making sure that we, listen to our customers. So customer experience is not like, you know, monitoring and tracking the output or the outcome. It is basically listening as we go and course correcting. Sometimes we won't get it right. And what that means is uh, for customers to kind of, you know, uh, basically engage with us and like, you know, be rewarded. We are exploring different channels. So even as one of them, other one is on site. So when they're logged in, like, you know, there's so much that we can do, like, you know, in terms of communicating with our customers. Uh, we are like, you know, developing products uh, through our app uh, where customers like you know uh, have an ability to basically select the topics that they want to follow and they want to kind of you know get news on, and 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 this is just the beginning I would say like you know uh, and then we have uh, other offline channels because not all customers will open all emails that we send to them so uh, like you know we have uh, we have direct mailers phone calls and then last but not the least the power of community and the power of social media I think that is humongous. And what that means is it's not just like, you know, uh, it's not just like, you know, reaching out and finding out our customers on social media channels. It is also basically creating a community of our users that basically like, you know, want to talk to each other, want to express opinions, want to kind of gather and like, you know, talk to the local journalists. So I think eventually what we want is, uh, Jake, we want like a unified omni-channel experience that our customers really enjoy and that basically keeps them coming back to us. So kind of, you know, become that like, you know, uh, one place for them to kind of stop for for the, the news leads and content leads. Ambitious goals. Um, I, I, totally. I love it. Selfishly, as a technology provider to the publishing universe um, in in the data space, um, I'm interested to know how you determine what the key technology tools are that you're going to bring to bear and how much of that, and that's massive, right? So you have the opportunity to develop probably certain tools in-house, um, as well as look to the, to the third party universe to bring in tools as well. Is that within your scope? And if so, how do you determine what you're going to build in-house versus what you're going to look to expertise from the outside to bring in in partnership? And um, maybe talk about it in terms of this year and maybe looking into to the roadmap for 2022, how do you look at, here's what we know we wanna build and here's where we might be looking for partnership from others uh, uh, in the outside community. T totally, so uh, like uh, it's it's actually public information, like Gannett has, uh, has a big, hairy, audacious goal. Uh, our goal is basically like, you know, 10 million subscribers by 2025. So we know that we are chasing that. And, and what we also know is like, you know, we are like, we have, a, great mix of people that we already hired from different kinds of companies. Like, you know, you name the brand and we, like, you know, have someone from that brand kind of working with us. So we have a great team that we put together. We have a great milestone. What we don't have is like, you know, a roadmap to kind of lead up to that milestone. We are still building it. So what that means is, uh, Jake, like, you know, um, definite, so to, to be very transparent, like, you know, in terms of vendor selection for technology, we have a great leader for marketing technology that kind of is leading that effort. 
uh, we are bringing in leadership on data science and analytics to kind of you know lead data side of things, but we also have a great leadership already for marketing technology and, and operations. So, uh, but like, you know, going back to your other question, like, you know, build versus buy, I think a lot of that will depend on like, you know, uh, on our goal, which already is set. So it's not really a moving target. It's not really like, you know, something that will evolve or change. So we have, we have like, you know, something that we have committed to ourselves and, um, and like, you know, we have to pursue it. So what that means is, Given like you know uh, where we are in terms of resourcing and in terms of staffing and in terms of delivery, I, I would say like you know the decision would be very straightforward uh, when it comes to build versus buy. Like you know we don't really have the luxury of waiting too long, if that makes sense. Sure, sure, absolutely. It, it brings up another topic that that ends up being a part of so many of these conversations. So social platforms are obviously a big referral source for you. Um, and yet at the same and, and, and masters of personalization. Um, and yet at the same time, very complicated relationship between the news media, the big news orgs, and, and the social platforms. How do you look at those referral sources? And how do you are are, are those partnerships? Uh, are they frenemies? Um, are they delivering data to you around the referrals that you're receiving? So you might be getting other signals in the background that may not show up on the page. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, you know, how do you work with the Twitters and how do you work with the Facebooks and the Snaps and the TikToks of the world in order to maximize what you can do? Because we certainly know how they're maximizing what you can do. Great question, uh, Jake. Although I would, I would caveat like this heavily, uh, I'm the engagement and detection guy. So I have a peer of mine who's acquisition lead. Uh, now they are the working, they are the ones who are working with like you know Facebooks and like you know uh, social medias of the world, day in and day out. My role and like you know how I kind of you know partner on social is basically using them for community building, using them to basically make sure that like you know we get the message and the word out, making sure that like you know if we have a new initiative coming up in the local market, we use our local uh, hashtags and like you know handles to get the information out. So for me, like you know the role is not really to kind of refer and acquire from social. For me, the role of social is to basically engage my customers on social along with other channels. Uh, and as far as like, you know, uh, tracking and like, you know, uh, and like, you know, ability to kind of monitor goals, I think we are in a good spot. Uh, uh, it's not ideal because I, I would imagine like, you know, at one point we'd have a unified voice of customer, where it's just like, not just social, like, you know, all channels, one unbiased voice of our customer for that particular market, for that particular piece of content. We're not there yet. Like, you know, that's what we want, where we want to kind of, you know, get towards. Uh, but I would say this, like, you know, when I joined USA Today and Gannett, I kind of came uh thinking like you know okay sure it's a it's a relatively small organization compared to a prior one like you know cvs health uh which is a 44 company and then i realized and i was shocked i was like oh my god this might be the biggest organization i've ever worked for because our products run in millions every piece of content is our product and that product can either engage or unengage a customer or like you know make them lose interest or gain interest any single moment so it's a it's a massively complicated like you know world but at the same time that's what makes it so exciting. So I think, uh, I think for us, like you know, uh, the key is understanding, like you know, what to show to who and when, and like you know, and how to kind of you know get their feedback at the same time. That is the key. So uh, I appreciate that. You think about audience all day long, and I'm sure that while we want to think of everyone as an individual, at the same time, we we make buckets or personas or, or, or whatever we want to call them. Tell me a little bit about news consumption across the generations, because uh, I think as, you know, as we were talking about earlier this morning, you know, we, we have a generation of boomers that, that maybe are our parents' generation, or for some of us, our grandparents' generation, where there was a very specific way in which news has been consumed for a long time, and a very different expectation of personalization and content consumption, as opposed to me as a Gen Xer or obviously millennials or then my kids that are Gen Z and below. And clearly there's a lot of different ways in which there's different platforms, different apps uh, uh, and just different expectations. How do you start to deliver experiences that maybe can, can speak to, to all of them in a news organization as large as Gannett? Love that question and love that, uh, love the point, uh, Jake. So yes, I, so our customers, like, you know, uh, millions and millions of our digital customers, uh, they're all so unique and so different. So, uh, like, you know, for us to kind of, you know, have one approach and, like, you know, one strategy throughout will definitely not be scalable. Uh, 
So absolutely. And, but what I would also say is like, you know, there are nuances more than just age, like, you know, uh, where the people are living, like, you know, sometimes we are surprised, like, you know, a woman living in a certain geography or like, you know, belonging to a certain, you know, arch type might be so different than like, you know, a, a Gen Z living in a different place. They actually like, you know, be, be closer than like, you know, uh, different age groups within their own geography. So uh, what that means is like, you know, uh, as an organization, we kind of, you know, started with segmentation, with understanding, like, you know, who our customers are, who our prospects are, who our general, like, you know, news readers are across the country. And then I think what we are trying to do now is we are trying to kind of, you know, like, nuance that further. Like, in an ideal world, I would love to know each and every customer of mine, because I think they are, I don't, I don't, and this is kind of goes in my theme, like, you know, we don't think of our customers as our customers versus, like, you know, we are, like, you know, the brand. We are, like, one extended large team. So the customers belong to our team. And what I would love to know is like, you know, what is it that I can expect from this customer? So because like, you know, when the expected does not happen, that triggers like, you know, oh my God, there's something wrong, go and fix it. So uh, now it's not possible to kind of, you know, do one million, like, you know, a million plus like, you know, uh, customizations. But what we are trying to do is we are trying to do sub-segmentation. We are trying to understand who this customer is, how are they consuming news, how often do they come to us? Some people, you'd be surprised, come for breaking news. Some people come for opinions. Now, those are two very different, like, you know, news pieces or category or content. So we are looking at uh, content consumption patterns, like, you know, uh, app and versus web versus print. Like, you know, where is it that the customers uh, enjoy reading the news more? What kind of experience works the best for them? And what we are trying to do at the end of the day is, like, instead of having, like, you know, millions of personas, we are still trying to kind of, you know, deeper dive into having at least some kind of uniform coherent clusters so that I know that, okay, this is the cluster that wants this particular experience. And then I want to kind of, you know, start tracking how are they behaving? Like, you know, if they are behaving consistently, then, then like, you know, we have consistent experience for them. So we want to like, you know, uh, uh, to kind of, you know, it's a very complicated question. <laughs> so I don't have a straightforward answer to it. Uh, it basically uh, is what is laying the foundation of our user experience efforts. So uh, in a nutshell, understand what to expect and then react when you don't get what you expected. Okay, well, as an expert in user experience, Android or iOS? Oh, for me personally, iOS. For you personal, iOS? Like, yeah, uh, uh, yes. My wife is Android, so. Mixed household. <laughs> yes. Um, but, but on a more serious note, when, when you have to think about platform and customization, um do you find that the organization as a whole um that, that that's more of a restriction meaning we have to be thinking about how we can customize in ways that can be cross-platform or do you have to be thinking about customization and per i should say personalization as that's the name of the of the topic today personalization in in, in a way that can be discrete for each platform uh i think it ultimately is a function of two things feasibility and scalability. So uh, if it is if it is like, you know, scalable to kind of, you know, create a custom experience or a personalized experience by platform in a discrete way, if, I, I would love to go for that, like, you know, but I don't think that is totally scalable. So uh, we go back to feasibility, like, you know, what is it that we can do today? So uh, as I said, like, you know, <laughs> uh, one thing that is very different and very exciting about my current role is uh, we have a set target. A lot of other companies, it was like, you know, okay, grow by 10%, grow by 15%. And when we come back and grow by 50%, people are like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Here we have a set in stone target. So I think we do have like, you know, the we do have the ability to kind of tweak, but like, you know, uh, we have like a clock that's ticking. So uh, so uh, ultimately, like, you know, we have to go back and prioritize if something is not scale, like, you know, not scalable and like, you know, we cannot deliver it, even though that's the ideal experience, let us start somewhere and like, you know, eventually like, you know, scale it. If that makes sense. So basically, like you know, not not. I don't think we can create a discrete experience by platform yet. But again, I'm not super qualified to answer that. Maybe. <laughs> um, totally understood. I think at some point we are supposed to take questions. So if people want to ask questions, go for it. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep asking questions because I have some more. Um, so feel free to chime in when the time is right. Um, clearly, as a news organization, your your scale. Um, goes up and down based on, on the news cycles. And I would think that from uh, a, a very contentious presidential election to now COVID-19 that has uh, certainly had, had much dur longer duration than many of us had expected. 
I would assume that content consumption is up. And, and because of that, does that provide more opportunity for you to personalize in the ways that you want? Or does that actually hold back your ability to do what you want because so much of the coverage is siloed in particular areas? That's a great point. Uh, so uh, the content consumption is not consistent here. So, uh, so like, you know, uh, like I was personally surprised to kind of, you know, notice that, like, you know, there are patterns that, you know, up and down, uh, even though there's so much going on, like, you know, I think in general, like, you know, customer, like, you know, uh, behavior has changed so much post COVID. Uh, like, you know, what existed before, like, you know, meaning like, you know, you have something going on, everybody kind of jumping on, but I think there's a fatigue. People have like, you know, read enough, like, you know, heard enough, like, you know, seen enough. So I think what we are trying to kind of understand is like, you know, okay, given like the new normal that we are in right now, what is it like, you know, that is, that is like, you know, making more sense. So uh, getting back, uh, I think like, you know, uh, that opportunity for us definitely is there. So like, you know, and we are trying to kind of, you know, become that, that like, you know, uh, objective, like, you know, uh, news providers, if you will. So we want to kind of make sure that our customers have access to news and like, you know, have access to updates on their fingertips. At the same time, we don't want to overwhelm them if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it absolutely makes sense. Yep. And those signals, obviously, I, you know, I'm just interested from a data perspective because you're looking for consistency of signal, right? And, and right now there's potential for noise because you have either a, a, a more, more audience or an audience coming for more particular types of content. And so clearly part of your job or, or your team, uh, I would imagine is to, you know, how do I consistently keep the signal and keep the noise uh, exactly. at bay? Exactly. All right. I like it. I like your job. Can I have it? <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> I love my job. <laughs> But great talking, Jay. Thank you. Yeah, Jay. yeah. Pleasure. Great. Thank you both so much for, for your time. This has been really interesting. I've um, just learned so much from you, Shiv. This is really cool. I loved the example you gave on email. I mean, obviously, you know, that is something we encounter here too. Those generalized emails just don't seem to perform, but it's, you know, what's that right type of content for you guys? That's localization. So I think that we can kind of take some learnings from that and really appreciate your time this afternoon. Awesome. Great being here, Marissa. Yeah, so thanks to all of our amazing marketers that shared their views today. Um, really appreciate it. We covered a lot in a short amount of time. So for our audience out there, please connect with our speakers on LinkedIn to stay up to speed on their work. And this concludes our um, public facing portion of today's event. If you are part of the 7-Eleven team, um, we will now be moving over to the uh, separate link. So you should have that in our marketing team's chat. And I will see you all there. Thank you again, Jake and Shiv. Have a great afternoon.